morning. This morning, if I could read upside down, uh, we're reading Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And this is God's word. We'll figure out this someday. All right. Welcome. Welcome to the house. Welcome to the family. Um, I just look outside this morning, and I know there are some divisions amongst our family this morning. Who thinks that, yes, please, snow, thank you, you're here finally. Yes, okay, three of you. <laughs> Who could say snow on, th- snow on Christmas Eve and Christmas and then stop? Who, who's on that train? All right. <laughs> well, it's just good to all be together and to just enjoy the reminder that our sins are washed white as snow. There is no purer reminder than that. And how God has reminded us of who he is in his creation. It is so good. And it's good to see every one of your faces in here this morning. For those of you joining online, it's good to have you with us as well. It's good to see some faces back. Um, and uh, it's just good to be together. I uh, had uh, Miss Pam over there read uh, one of the most important passages for the church to cling to every moment of every day because the primary purpose of the church could be summed up in one word. is discipleship. Discipleship. That's what he means by go and make disciples. And we've kind of been talking about that through this series on the church. What is the church truly supposed to be? Let's discover what that's supposed to be as God had uh, directed it in, in Jesus. And, and then the, the church of Acts started embracing. And so what is there for us to discover embrace as a church today? It kind of uh, involves us unlearning some things as well in order to learn truer things. And so that's the, that's the first point on your, bull, on your bulletin notes. I, I didn't put it in the slides, and I apologize. But the primary purpose of the church, remember this always, is discipleship. What does that mean? We're going to get into that. But the church, specifically, is God's primary means uh, the, uh, the mode, the conduit, the channel which he's going to use for discipleship to take place in believers' lives. And for some of us, that's a no-brainer, right? It's a no-brainer. Of course, yeah, make disciples. That makes sense. And for others, if I were to just ask first, what do you think the primary purpose of the church is? Uh, there could have been a, a, a plethora of uh, things that would have been said. Worship God, of course. Glorify God, gather in Jesus' name, preach the good news. And those are all great and true about what the church is supposed to do. But there is a primary missional purpose to the church. What are we supposed to actively be pursuing amidst our worship, amidst our gathering, amidst our remembering and preaching the good news? For, for Crossroads, this is defined, we define it simply as to know Jesus in a relational sense, you know, to know someone like you know a friend. Uh, the, the word know in, in the Old Testament, especially in Genesis, was the word know when it said that Adam knew his wife. It was, a, it was this, getting this picture of this intimate connection. And when we know Jesus, we know him personally. We know him relationally. And to make him known, to help others personally know this Jesus, know this God who has created us to know him. And the one who redeems our life to put on the purpose we were created for whose image we were fearfully and wonderfully made to reflect to the world. And that's what discipleship does. It's making Jesus known, not just within our own hearts, but in the hearts of others, right? So discipleship, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them, and surely I'm with you always. But what does this mean or what does this look like for us, right? We've been talking about this. We've been looking at the book of Acts. We've seen glimpses of it. They were together. They were teaching one another. They were helping each other remember what they believe. Um, and, but do we see this aspect of discipleship clearly in the book of Acts, right? Jesus summed up what making disciples looks like in baptism and teaching. 
right? The main command is to make disciples, and there's these what we call uh, participles, which just kind of reinforce the main command. This is how you're going to do it. Baptize, teach, and I'm with you. So, but what does that mean? What does that have to do with making disciples, baptism, and teaching? Now, there, I see five, or I picked out, I didn't see, but I, I picked out five testimonies within the book of Acts that I think help us understand what this means, what this discipleship process means. And by testimonies, I mean stories of individuals who were discipled by other believers, other Jesus followers, and each of them gives us insight into where this process of discipleship or spiritual formation, as I'm also going to call it, takes place in our lives. Where does this meet us today, this morning, this week? All right. So we're just going to get right into it. So if you would turn with me to the book of Acts, it's after the four Gospels, in uh, chapter 8. Chapter 8 of the book of Acts, starting in verse 4. This is going to be our first Testimony, our first story of an individual who was discipled and where that kind of relates to us. It's a story about a man named Simon. So starting in verse 4, it'll be on the screen as well. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits were crying out with a loud voice and came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed so that there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed after being baptized and continued with, with Philip, seeing the signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. I wonder if you picked up what Luke was doing there. He was comparing Philip and how he was living his life and Simon. And the, there's these parallels there. And I'm going to point these out to you. But see, Simon was this man who spent his life trying to make much of himself, right? He was amazing the people with his magic. They, they actually called himself him. He called himself somebody great, but they were calling him also. This is the power of God called great. So this man was making his living being somebody great. And it said they paid attention to him because of what he was doing. And then Philip, it, it, it's like Simon's story is kind of sandwiched in between Philip and what he was doing and then what happened when he encountered Philip. He spent his life making much of God. They paid attention to him. They saw the signs that he was doing. They were amazed by him, like they were amazed by Simon but, Simon, but Philip was pointing to God, not himself as somebody great. Philip was making God look great. Right? And they believed Philip. It said they were paying attention to Simon, but then they paid attention to Philip. And every one of them that was paying attention to Simon now turned the other way and paid attention to Philip. What is, what is Luke the writer of Acts trying to reveal for us here. But I just think it's so beautiful that even Simon himself believed. He was amazed. This man who thought he was great was captivated. There's a clear distinction we see here between making much of self and making much of God with your life. Which one, though, brought more captivating and convincing power? Which one even captivated the one who was captivating others, right? And, and there's another thing that, as I was looking at this passage that pointed out to me, and it's, it's, it's also sandwiched in between here, that after Philip had gone to Samaria and he was preaching and people were being healed and, and demons were being cast out, verse 8 says, so that there was much joy in that city. That was the, that was the result 
of the gospel coming to that city. I don't know what the result was to Simon's magic and people were amazed, but it said that there was much joy that entered that city. And I'll hang on to that when we get to the next story. But which, which guy's life brought more convincing, captivating, worshipful power and joyful results to the people? And I thought of a quote from a sermon I heard a, uh, a while back. Uh, and John Piper, he's, he's a pastor, preacher, writer, and he says, or he asks, do you feel more loved by God because he makes much of you or because God at great cost to his son, Jesus, frees you to enjoy making much of him forever? The aim of that question, making much of you or making much of him, has never been to deny that God makes much of us. He does. He does make much of us. The aim, though, has been to help people relocate the bottom of their joy, the decisive foundation of their joy, the base, the basis. Relocate the bottom of their joy from self to God. So does God make much of us or does he free us to make much, enjoy making much of him? And the, found, and the, the aim of that question is to relocate the bottom of our joy. Piper, he kind of concluded his message by saying that even if the end of God's works, his goal, the result of God's works was, to, uh, was for us to be our greatest joy, to be the bottom of our joy, to be making much of ourself for our joy, our own glory, it ultimately would not satisfy our hearts because our hearts were made to make much of God, to make him look great, to be satisfied in his greater glory. Therefore, the work of God in Jesus Christ, the good news is that God's love has made it possible for our priorities to be relocated, refounded in Jesus and experience everlasting joy for all eternity, making much of God. What does that mean? Well, that even if we can make much of ourselves, it's not really that valuable. It's not that great because God is infinitely greater. And so he has made it possible through Jesus for us to enjoy making God look great, right? To shine his glory. And he's saying, if you turn that inward, that's not going to satisfy. It's not going to last. It's not as great as if your life made God look great, right? The good news is that God has made it possible for us to be made great by making him look great. Simon, he went around making himself one that was great. But it's understandable now that even Simon was captivated by the message of Jesus Christ. Somebody who thought he was somebody great heard a message that God is greater. And he can spend his life making him look great. That even Simon was convinced. And and Simon, he gave his life to Jesus and he started following him. He left his life of trying to amaze other people to try to amaze people with God's love, with God's greatness. But he still had some learning to do. I'm not going to read it, but the next passage in in, in Acts chapter 8 is still going on with Simon. and, And Peter and John come onto the scene, come to Samaria, and they start laying hands on people so that they can receive the Holy Spirit. And then, it, then Luke writes this. Now, when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Give me this power also so that anyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could attain the gift of God with money. He's still got some things to rewire. In reality, he is, his priorities were still founded in what he could do, what he thought was important, his values, how he lived his life, what he lived his life for. It was still in him, what he could do, what he could achieve. I can buy God. I can buy his love. I can buy his power. I can buy his presence. The Holy Spirit, key person in the book of Acts, I can buy him. And Peter's saying, he's a gift. You don't buy gifts for yourself if God is trying to give it to you. He's like, this is a gift. He's trying to give this to you. Simon's priorities were still founded in what he could do instead of receiving and enjoying and living out of 
what God had already done and had already wanted to give him. This Holy Spirit is a gift. And this kind of reveals to us our first insight. That discipleship, and when I talk about discipleship, I mean this process of becoming, right? Becoming like what? And that's what we're going to talk about. But becoming, disciple, comes from the root word in, in the Greek, mathetes, which means to learn. So we're learners, we're learning. It's this process of learning. Learning what? Learning a new way that Jesus came to start. This process of discipleship revol- involves refounding our priorities from self to God. Our priorities, our values, what's important to us, how we live our life, what we live our life for. It goes from being in ourselves, what we can do, what we're about, to being in God. Right? And that shifts the, the, perp- the, the priorities of our life. It shifts our life becoming about something so much greater than ourselves and what we can do. And so that's what discipleship is. It's, it's this relearning. It's this refounding. It's this... It's this uh, re-renewing, re-becoming. And our priorities are going from self to God. So where do we place our priorities? Where do you place your priorities? Where do I place my priorities? Is it in what I can muster by my own means and glory? Or is it receiving and resting and living in the free gift of God through Jesus? And this is testing, right? Right? Because we love it when we can achieve something ourselves. I have done this and it is mine and I have done it great and I feel good now because I've done it well and it's the work of my hands. The fact that the greatest possible thing that can become a part of our lives, become our lives, we can't earn, we can't work for, we can't buy. We have to trust in God not ourselves. Abandon, surrender, die to self. Refounding our priorities, our values, what's important from self, what I can do, what I can be, what I can make, what I can buy, to being in God. That's the first thing. The second story is in, still in chapter 8, starting in verse 26. I'm going to read this. So you just got to Look over. Now he says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, we're still with Philip now, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, who was the queen of the Ethiopians. And he was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. And Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, Well, how can I unless somebody guides me? And he he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture in Isaiah that he was reading was this Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb that is before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about somebody else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, he came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, look, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way, rejoicing. Rejoicing. If you just look at this guy's life, this what Luke, he calls him an Ethiopian eunuch, so we don't know his actual name, but you can get some, we can get some inferences about his life. First of all, being a eunuch, family is out of the picture, right? In the ancient world, family was important because it was more, it was more of an economic thing, like you are your family, right? Who you come from, who you belong to, it's a part of your identity, it's part of who you are, it's a part of how your name will live on. You know, you need, we talked, I think we talked about it last week or yeah, we did. How the, 
you needed to have a son because that's how your life lived on. That's not in this man's destiny. How he came to be the way that he is, we don't know. But the fact that is one of the most important things about your identity in the ancient world was not something that he could hope in. No family, no legacy. When his life ends, that's it for his name. But things can't be all that bad because he is literally the treasurer of an entire country. He is the, tre- he's the keeper of the treasures of the queen of Ethiopia. So he's got a high status. He is a high official. He is wealthy. He's got his own chariot, which is something big. Now, he's got his own chariot. He is wealth, wealthy. He is high in status. But again, with no one to carry on that legacy, what, to what end is all the status and money in the world? And when you die, you're just going to get replaced. The queen of Ethiopia is just going to replace you. Now we look at what, where he was coming from. He was coming from Jerusalem. Remember all the Jews and, and everybody was coming to Jerusalem to worship and to be a part of the festivals. And now he's departing out. It said he had gone there to worship. Now he's from Ethiopia. Perhaps he was a Jewish convert. We don't know. But he's worshiping. And what does worship mean? That, that you're seeking something beyond this life. You're trusting and hoping in something beyond this life. So he's worshiping. And he's reading Isaiah. Though it seems like he, he can't really understand much of what he's saying but he's trying so hard what's he doing he's searching he's searching my life is going to end at some point and all this stuff that i've accumulated this wealth i don't have any family is there something more that i can hope in he's searching but he needs someone to guide him he needs someone to guide him and Philip says, Luke says that Philip started with the scripture that he was reading in Isaiah. And what does this tell us? He tells him the gospel starting with Isaiah. But this points to something greater, that, that all the scriptures are a unified story that point to Jesus. It, it, it's a unified story of who God is and what he has willed for, human, for the creation and in his love and in his perfect justice. And how Jesus is the culmination of that story to redeem that. And anybody who hopes in Jesus will have that redeemed purpose, that redeemed relationship with God. So that all the scriptures are a unified story. All 66 books are not separate stories with different meanings and different, uh, different things to believe in. It's all one unified story about the creator and the Messiah who came to restore creation. And he says he starts with that scripture to lead him in that. And then it says the Ethiopian, he believed in Jesus, he was baptized, and he went on his way rejoicing. Remember how when Philip, he left Samaria, that city was filled with joy. What's the result when the gospel comes and goes? Right? Joy is left. Right? But he went on his way rejoicing. Why? Here's this man, treasurer of Ethiopia, and now he's going on with a greater treasure of a greater kingdom to share and he says this is what defines my life the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field Matthew 13 44 say the treasure of heaven this gospel is something worth giving every part of your life to giving everything to this treasure, to this purpose. Discipleship, it involves a refounding of our purpose from being in the world to being in God. Discipleship involves refounding, rebasing what we live for, our purpose, what defines us, what gives us value, what gives us legacy, an identity from being in the world, what I do, what my family is, what my past is. This guy's probably got a messed up past. But now it's in God, and he's got more joy than anything it could ever describe. Every other purpose in the world 
Every other purpose the world offers cannot compare with the infinite worth and everlasting joy that God offers through Jesus Christ. To receive him as our perfect purpose, our fullness. Every morning you wake up and you are already filled and full and fully defined in God. No amount of work, right? No amount of status. Nothing else in our life can give us more greater purpose. And you wake up and you just know, I don't got to lift a finger today. And I'm fully purposeful and loved. This doesn't make life less worth living in that why I shouldn't do anything else or I don't have anything else to do because God has already done it all for me. No, this, this makes our purpose renewed in that we can live for his purposes a true joy because it has everlasting fruit. It's not uncertain or, or fading, right? The Ethiopian eunuch, he was like, man, I don't, my, as soon as this is over, I mean, it's over. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what will become of my life, my name. But now he knows that what he's living for is worth giving it all for, giving his whole life for. He has his identity, his purpose founded fully and completely in God. And that's what he offers us. Jesus offers us. Right? If you're searching, if you're thinking there's got to be more, because this isn't worth I could lose this thing tomorrow and it wouldn't really matter. There's got to be more. There is. I'm going to go into the third story. Now, this is a man we haven't met yet, but he's of vital importance to the Christian faith. And I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I put it on the back of your bulletin notes. It's the story of Saul's conversion, right? Now Saul, I think we met back in chapter 7, when Stephen was being stoned, it said that Saul was approving of his stoning. He was a Pharisee. He was one who was doing the exact same thing that the Pharisees who killed Jesus did. Was he with all those Pharisees that killed Jesus? We don't know. But he was a man who thought he was standing for the truth of God's word, and he was going around arresting Christians for the gospel, arresting Christians for the name of Jesus for professing him. He's going around killing Christians for the same thing. In, in, this, in, in chapter 9, we see that Paul, he, or Saul, I'm going to call him Paul because I'm going to end up calling him anyway. Paul, he's eventually called in chapter 11, I think. Because that's his Gentile name, his, his Roman name. He was born in Rome, but he's a Jew um, by ethnicity. His Jewish name is Saul, but his Roman name is Paul. So I'm going to call him Paul. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul, he's on his way to Damascus under order to go and continue doing the same thing. Arrest Christians, kill Christians, whatever. And he encounters Jesus in this miraculous moment. And it says in, in verse 8 that although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So he encounters Jesus in this great light. And it says that something like scales were put over his eyes. Jesus is like, why are you persecuting me? Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it says that although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. And it reminded me of something that Jesus said, and, um, or what John had wrote down of something that Jesus said in his gospel. He said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And he's speaking to Pharisees in that, in that account, in that interaction. He's saying, you think you know the truth? You think you know God's word? You think you know what God stands for and who he is? But you're blind. You don't see. Me coming into the world and my gospel is going to uh, virtually blind you because you think you know what's true, but what I am bringing is nothing like you've ever seen or known. Well, Jesus... He says to Paul while he's blinded, he says, go into the city. There's a man named Ananias. He'll help you see. And he goes in and and then Jesus comes to Ananias, who's in the city, a disciple of Jesus. And he says, look, there's this guy, Saul. He's going to come to you. You need to help him see. And he's like, what a Saul, he's the guy that's killing people. You want me to go and you want me to help him? He says, yes, yes, I want you to do that. And And it says that when he came and 
came to Ananias. Ananias, he came, he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared to you on the road by which you came and sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Paul was blind and he needed someone to help him see. And the third thing is that discipleship involves refounding our principles in what we've always believed to what's actually true. From what we've always believed, what we've always stood for, what we've always been convinced and convicted of as this is right and true and I'm going to stand for this, to what's actually true. Receiving that, being humbled and being taught what is actually true. See, that one can be hard. Because a lot of us are convinced and founded on what I believe is right and I'm going to stand for it and I'm not going to let anybody change my mind. We're convicted of what we think is righteous truth. We're convinced, we're not convinced otherwise until it's, it's, it's exposed. But we need to always keep an open heart, open mind, humbled, hands open, knees to the floor, saying, how could I ever know what's right? Fully, completely. Hearts open, minds open to new realities. God's want, God wants to challenge our understanding of life with through his word. Saul, Paul, whatever, was convinced. The Pharisees who killed Jesus were convinced, but they were looking at the very one who is God. They were blind. See, I myself have lately been humbled to remember how could I ever think that I could know everything that's right? There's only one that knows what's right. And I have a limited, finite understanding of what life's all about. I need to keep my hands open. I need to remain curious. I need to remain humble to what else there is to know that I don't yet know. The most foolish thing that we could ever say, that could ever come out of our mouth or come out of our heart is that I know. It all. I know what's right. I'm the one who knows it. No. <laughs> the food, most foolish person in the world is the one who thinks he's the most wise. I think that's something we should always remember. But the, probably the most wise person is the one that says, I'm open to whatever the Lord, God, Creator, all wise, a knows has made right, has made true, and he wants to reveal. I'm going to remain open to that. And Saul, he needed to do some, a lot of heart work, a lot of mind work. He needed to relearn. We talked about this at the guy's uh, relational discipleship, that he probably needed to relearn everything in the scriptures because he had seen it one way. This discipleship, I'm going to move on, but this discipleship thing involves we need to keep an open mind and open heart to what's really true, saying that maybe perhaps what I've always thought was true isn't, isn't always what's right and true. Let me keep an open mind. Let not my mind be controlled by what the internet says, by what Facebook says, by what the government says, by what anything else, by what my own mind and opinion says. Let my heart and mind be ruled by the one who created my heart and mind. I submit it before him. Right? I'm going to move on. The fourth story story. There's much more we could talk about with Paul, and you can read it on your own, but he was off the scene for a while, because he had to relearn, and he had, to, he had trouble getting reintegrated into the church. He needed people to come around him, which kind of it hits at some of our, other, our last two stories, but our last story is in uh, chapter 16. You won't have to turn there. It's just a few verses. It'll be on the screen. Verse 16 or chapter 16, it says, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, a son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, a believer in Jesus, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that place, for they knew that his father was a Greek. Now, Paul had already taken a missionary journey through that place. And perhaps that's where this Jewish woman, uh, who we know later, is, whose name is Eunice, um, became a believer in Jesus Christ. And perhaps she's the one who helped Timothy 
come to believe in Jesus Christ. We know his father was a Greek. We don't know if he was a part of Timothy's life or not, but we can probably conclude that he wasn't a, a great figure for Timothy's uh, faith in Jesus, wasn't one that led him to believe more in Jesus. But, but we know that uh, Paul, he probably credits Timothy's mom and his grandma for the faith that Timothy has. He writes in his second letter to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you also. He gives credit to those two ladies for the faith that Timothy has, right? And again, we don't know what happened to his, uh, what was going on with his father, but these two women, uh, and it says that uh, we perhaps know that Timothy had grown up with the scriptures. His mom was Jewish, so he probably grew up with that. But he writes also in that letter that, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing that, uh, knowing whom you learned it and how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So Timothy, I mean, he's really been set up for success in his faith. This to, to know the scriptures, to know Jesus by these two ladies who have been teaching him the word of God. But Paul himself, he also describes what his relationship to Timothy was. He wanted him to accompany him, to follow him. And we talked, we've seen this in, in our uh, Philippians studies that Timothy in Paul's relationship was like as a son with his father. And he's not actually his father, but it's indicating the type of influence he had as a spiritual father as a spiritual mentor in Timothy's life. And we go, we go on in Timothy's story, and we see that perhaps he became a quick, quickly became a mature disciple uh, because, again, he was well spoken of by the brothers. And, and we see in our, in our Philippian study that um, uh, Paul thought Timothy was in a, an ample, a worthy, an excellent example for the Philippians to take on the sort of character and attitude and way of living that he wanted them to, that was first perfectly displayed in Jesus. And so Timothy himself becomes a discipler, having been discipled by his grandma, his mother, and Paul, and other, probably the other disciples and apostles he was around, and now he's become somebody to disciple. And what is this telling us? That discipleship involves key people helping us mature and so that we can disciple others. Helping us grow, helping us mature so that we can disciple others. It's the, it says this aspect of discipleship, making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And that's how it works, but it involves key people coming in who know more than we do, right? You can help guide us who are further along the path and the journey of Christ-likeness and walking with Jesus than we are to help us become more like that image we were made to be. Discipleship involves key people. Who have been key people in your life? Can you think back over your life and see who were those key people that really helped me understand? Maybe there were direct influence on you. Maybe they weren't. Maybe you just had a quick conversation and it just helped you see things differently. It helped you know Jesus differently. It helped you know Jesus deeper. Who are those key people? Who have you been in another's life? How have you helped them, somebody else, understand Jesus more? Maybe it was a family member. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was a spouse. Who have you been in another's life to help them become more like Jesus, to know him more? But this requires some introspection, looking inward, some prayerful work to discern because we're all on this journey, this unfinished race. Where do I need to be discipled? Where have I not yet been made un like unto Christ? And who am I being led to disciple? Who is God calling me to like the Spirit and was calling Philip to Samaria. It was calling Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch. Probably led Paul to that place where he was going to call Timothy to follow him. Who are those people that I'm being led to disciple? And uh, a key hint is to see that 
he's probably calling you to disciple the people that you're closest with first. Your family, your spouse, friends. There are people, key people that he's placed in our lives and he's led our lives to for this discipleship process to take place. Key people, and we're going to see this in, in the last story, but key people, who are those people that have discipled you? Where are you still needing to be discipled? And who am I being led to disciple? In the fifth story. Um, in chapter 18. You can turn there if you want. It'll be on the screen, but... This is the last one. And I think this might, might challenge us deeply. Verse 24. It's a story about a na man named Apollos. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila, that's a husband and wife uh, who became believers, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And, then, and when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those through grace who through grace had believed. I think I went on a little bit more. But all of these stories, we can kind of see some things. It's almost like there's this progression, right? Simon, he was at this place where he needed some, some wires reworked because he, he, was, he came from a very secular place. He did not have any sort of framework for Christianity or Judaism or anything like that. He needed some wires to work. Now, Timothy, I mean, it seemed like he was really set up for success in his faith. I mean, Paulos, if there's at any point in this progression that we might call spiritual maturity, right, where I'm becoming and coming more like Jesus, just like how I mature biologically, we mature spiritually. It's this interconnectedness of our human nature that God has created to show us this sort of uh, lives that he's called us to. But if there's any, at any point, there's a point of arrival in this progression towards spiritual maturity, it seems as though that Apollos was somebody who nailed it. It said he was an eloquent man. He was competent in scriptures, that he knew them like the back of his hand. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. That word accurately almost could be translated exactly he, tran he, he taught almost exactly what needed to be taught. But then it says that Priscilla and Aquila, this uh, husband and wife discipleship powerhouse, they came and they it said that they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. He knew as much as he knew up to that point. Right? He knew John's baptism, which means he knows John's uh, testimony. He knows his message. He knows what he's taught through the scriptures. That's probably where he learned. But they said, they said that they came and taught him, taught him a little bit more exactly because of what they had experienced and what they've been taught. He did not yet know um, What did I write? I didn't edit that part. But they, he didn't know what he didn't know basically. Right? He knew as much as he knew, which was exactly what he was able to teach, but he needed to know a little bit more. He still needed to progress in what he understood about his faith and about God and about the, and about the gospel. See, if anybody looks like they would have ever arrived at this point of spiritual maturity, no longer needing to learn anymore, grow anymore, go any deeper, it looked like it was Apollos. And there's also another man who, if, if there was anybody who didn't need to grow anymore, didn't need to go deeper anymore, didn't need to love more, didn't need to have any more joy, didn't, didn't need to know anything more about how to live this gospel reality, it was probably the Apostle Paul. But he writes in our, in our Philippians um, study we're going to get to 
But he writes this in verse 12 to verse 16. He says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. He says, I've not gotten there. But I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider I've made it my own yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think in this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. He's speaking to this nature of growth and maturity in the call of God, in the life of God. And he says, look, let those of us who are mature think this way. What way? I've not arrived. Right? That's what maturity looks like. I've not gotten there. I'm not perfect. I have more to know and to know in the mind and know in the heart. He says, if anything you think otherwise, God will quickly let you know that that's not true. I've been experiencing that this week and almost every week. <laughs> Look, you, you don't know as much as you think you know, buddy. And I think that should be our, all of our attitude. That discipleship involves an ongoing process of spiritual growth ongoing process of spiritual growth. Honestly, that, that passage right there in Philippians, I've memorized that before, and I encourage you in that. Preach that to yourself every day. I'm not there yet, but I'm going to keep going. I'm not there, but I'm going to keep going. It is a prize. It is something worth more of my life's pursuit than anything else. But overall, we need to remain in a humble attitude of not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on. This is what we're all called to. To, me, to pursue this ongoing process, to remain open to how our Father is guiding our growth where He knows we need it most. Right? We may not know what we need to grow in, but He may send key people along our way to say, to, to look at our life from a different perspective. We may have progressed in some areas too. I may be well in this area, but, I, but there's going to be areas where I need to experience deeper growth. Deeper growth. Now, all of these testimonies clearly involved needed ways to learn the way of Jesus clearer, further from ground zero or from the point that we're at and continue to grow. But the discipleship aspect of Teaching was clear. We all need to have a transformed, need to be transformed and shaped into a progressively Christ-like image. And we, we have to learn that. We have to be taught that. Um, but where does baptism relate to all this? Where does baptism relate to all this? We said at the beginning that Jesus kind of sums up what it would look like to be made into a disciple and to make disciples by baptism and Teaching. Before I get into that, I want to, I want to share the key point. In that discipleship can also be referred to as this spiritual formation. Spiritual formation, in, in, in a sentence, is the process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. A process of being conformed to the image of Jesus for the sake of others. Now, it's, that's not original to me. I learned that in uh, college, and it's from this guy named Dr. Robert Mulholland. He wrote a book on spiritual formation and discipleship. Um, and that is, in a concise sentence, what we have all engaged in, have all committed to as we become followers of Jesus Christ. A process, a journey, an adventure of being conformed, transformed, taught, reshaped, becoming, image of Jesus. As we were created in the beginning to be the image of God, we need to be conformed because we've been conformed to a different image, the image of the world, the different, we've been created in the image of God, but sin has marred that image. And we're not going to drift toward godliness, we're going to drift towards wherever sin's going to entice us. And this spiritual formation is a commitment, a process of being conformed to the image of Christ, 
for the sake of others, not for my own sake, but for the sake of others, and you could add to the glory of God as well. So where does baptism come into all this? We see in each one of these stories, I won't read them, but each one of these stories, there involves a point in which it says, he was baptized, he was baptized, he was baptized, if you picked up on that. It doesn't say that for Timothy, but let's just assume he was baptized, okay? But baptism, being an outward symbol of an inward transformation, is important, right? That's what we mean by baptism. When, when, when you're lowered down into the water and brought back up, it's this symbol of what has happened in your, in your heart. It's this symbol of what has happened in your life. You have died to self and been raised to new life. You've identified with Jesus Christ in his death. And now the life you now live is by faith in the Son of God. He gives you life. So this outward symbol of an inward transformation is important because it indicates what or who I'm being committed to being transformed into, right? As I now have this new life and I'm going to live in this new way, what is it that I'm going to become? And baptism says, I'm going to become like Jesus. This is who I'm going to identify as. It's a public proclamation of this is who I follow. Paulus knew John's baptism, and, and you, if you read on uh, more in that story, you'll see that Paul came on the scene and baptized them um, in the name of Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, but baptism indicates who or what I'm being transformed into. It's a matter of identity transformation. I was once this in my old self. My priorities, my purpose, my principles the people I'm around, the people that influence me. What was the fifth P? I don't know where it is. That was people, yeah. The people that influence me. All these factors, that's, that's who made me who I was before. But now I'm committed to my priorities, my purpose, my principles, my people. There was a fourth P, right? Or a fifth P. Where's my fifth P? Principles, be Process, that's right. We're in that one, aren't we? <laughs> but I'm committed to this new way, this new life in Jesus, Jesus' image. Everything around the world is going to offer a, a, a priority, something to live, base your life on, a purpose, something to live your life for, priorities, something to be convicted to to share and to a message to proclaim and to live for. They're all kind of interconnected in people that are going to influence my life, right? If it's not somebody that's godly, it's going to be somebody who's ungodly, right? But now this spirit, this discipleship process, this spiritual formation says, this is where my life's going to go. The aim of spiritual formation or discipleship is to be conformed to the image of Jesus for the sake of others. This involves a refounding of our values, our identity, our truth. It involves key people helping us guide, guide us toward that goal. We see all those people that were involved in the process. That wasn't just exclusive to um, Timothy's story. It was, ex it was in all those stories you saw. There was a person that encountered them and helped them along the path. And it's a process. It's a lifelong process process. Understand, you've been committed to a marathon. You've been committed to a marathon. And you don't win a marathon by not running it, not training for it. We got we to gotta commit to it. But even in this lifelong process of becoming, we don't quite arrive until we meet the one we were created to reflect face to face. The one in Philippians, Paul, he writes, the one who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. But that's a process that starts right now. It starts now and lasts forever. The kingdom of heaven comes into our life until we get to that point of glory. It's a process, and it begins now. And the church is a means, is God's means through which this process of being conformed to the image of Jesus for the sake of others, it's a mouthful, takes place. The church, what we do in here. You know, I pray God for strength and wisdom as, as I and as uh, the leaders of this church who have committed to making this a place where Jesus is known and 
known even deeper through us. And our relational discipleship groups, I, I feel, are a huge win for developing this culture of becoming, that we're going to get together, we're going to shape each other, we're going to push and pull each other towards becoming more of what Christ had come to begin and form in us. But it also involves in and outside the Sunday morning or Tuesday, Wednesday gatherings. We commit to having our hands and our hearts open to paying attention. God, where are you teaching me? What are you trying to form in me this week, today? Where are you working on in us and how are you trying to work through us? Now, I've, I've talked a lot about replacing and refounding our priorities and, and principles and purposes and people, right? But this does not mean that we give up on our relation and our give up on our uh, on our responsibilities with our family and our hobbies and our jobs and, and giving ourselves fully to that. But this means that the only basis of who we are and how we understand and live in the world is Jesus. I can be friends with unbelievers, and we should be. I, I can be committed to my work and giving myself fully to it. I can, can be committed to my family, making that a very important part of my life. But the only thing that's going to shape me, the only thing that's going to influence how I engage in those relationships is Jesus. Look to Jesus. And this necessitates time devoted to knowing Jesus. What is he like? What does he value? What are his priorities? What is his purpose, his principles? And allowing him to prior and prioritizing his influence. Now, as I closed, remember, as we've learned throughout this series, church is a whole way of life. Because it's not just a Sunday morning, two-hour way of life. It is a whole 24-7, 365 way of life until I die. Because the gospel affects all of life. So if discipleship, this, this process of becoming like the image of Jesus in the church is the overarching missional purpose of the church, and that means the overarching mission of the church is or of my life is discipleship. I should be giving myself to this becoming. I should be giving myself to being made into and to multiply the image of Jesus. To being made into the image of Jesus myself and to multiply it in others. And this is humanity being remade. It's not something different. It's going back to what we were created to be in the garden. In church is this humanity being remade into what it was intended to be. That's church. Becoming the people we were created to be. So let's give ourselves to. I hope, pray, you're not only challenged, but blessed by that invitation to become more and fully and deep, deeper like Jesus. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you so much for bringing us together this morning in this beautiful yet cold yet wet day for bringing us into this room to hear your word, to be blessed by the company of one another, to be blessed by the, by the uh, opportunity and gift that it is to worship someone greater than ourselves, to, to be freed to enjoy making much of God forever. Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would pull us deeper into this invitation, into this responsibility, into this gift of new life. Father, would you continue to press on our hearts the ways in which we are being called to be discipled, to be made more like Jesus, expose ways in which we are not mature, but in also give us strength to attain to what we've already been taught. And Father, press us to the people that you want us to be a Christ-like image to. Who are you sending us to? Whether it's someone like the other person that lives in our house. The other people that occupy our house. Those that we regularly engage with. Even if they already know Jesus, how can I help them know Jesus more with my life? It's for the sake of others. Help us know this. Help us see this in your word every day. And we just thank you so much that we are not left to 
purposes and priorities and principles that are fading, that are, uh, that are cheap. And we are given life. We are given purpose. We are given something to live for, something to stand for that will last for eternity. That will have everlasting fruit beyond this life. Help us to live for greater things. The greater one who gives us that gift of the Holy Spirit, gift of the gospel, gift of Jesus. So I pray your grace on these people and on my own life. Take us deeper into Jesus. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And the church together said, Amen. Go enjoy the snow.